Okay, we're jumping into the middle of the book, Colossians. I'm just going to give you a one, two sentence summary of chapter two. So Paul ends chapter two by stating or arguing that no matter how many rules and restrictions we put on ourselves, it's never good enough to take away our sinful desires. So in chapter three, he's going to pick up by saying we have the power and victory over our sins and the desires of our sins. We're buried with Jesus when he died. And we are now re risen and seated with Christ. So let's go ahead and read verse 1 of chapter 3. Oh, 1 through 4. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. So, maybe you, most of us have heard this before, that Jesus came to earth, He died upon the cross, He was buried for three days, and then He was risen again, right? Most of us know that. The Gospel, He died for us, He died and gave us life. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We died with Jesus. We were buried with Jesus. And we rose again with Jesus. And that's, that's a beautiful picture of baptism, death, and the new life coming out of the water. That's what Romans chapter 6 tells us. So lately when I've been facing a difficult issue, a personal issue, you know what I tell myself? I tell myself, you are risen with Christ. You can overcome this. It's Christ who lives in me now. Christ gives us the strength to overcome whatever we're facing. Right? We have all different walks of life in this room. So many different trials and sickness and pain. But there's something we should always remember. We are raised with Christ if we believe in Jesus and what He has done. He didn't just save us and leave us alone. He came to live inside of us. And that is a beautiful thing. So if you notice, first He says, Seek those things which are above. But then he says, set your mind on things above. So take action and continually think about the things which are above. And you might say, well, what does that mean? Uh, seeking the things that are above, like the heavens up there. You know, we usually typically think about it. And earth is down here. So do, do I just pray? Am I just supposed to pray all day long? Is that what seeking heaven is like? Yes, that's only a small part of it. Um, you might also be thinking in your head, maybe reading your Bible. That's how I get set my mind on things above. Or fasting, or praising as we were just doing, singing, or giving money, or serving, preaching the gospel, making disciples. Yes, those are all part of seeking heaven. But there's more. We're going to read that throughout the rest of the chapter. I also want to make a point and go back to verse 1 that... Christ is sitting down. His work was complete. Our sins are finished. Right? We sin every day, of course. But the price that was paid for them, He no longer has to keep on making sacrifices for us. He doesn't have to die on the cross again every time we sin. No, He died once and for all. He cleanses us from sin. i got to ask you this question. Have you been thinking about this? Have you been seeking heaven lately. Right? We get so focused on our work, our family, the news, our problems. And I hope, as Christians, as believers, we're seeking God. Put it simply. Seeking heaven. Not, what do I have to do? What are my plans? Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all things will be added unto you. 
That's one of my life verses. It's from Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God. Doesn't mean we, can, we can't have fun on a jet ski or go uh, to an amusement park. No. Doesn't mean we can't have a nice house or a nice car or nice things. No. But what is most important to you? What gives you the most pleasure and joy and contentment? Is it God or is it things and possessions and status and position? you got to ask yourself that every once in a while. I'm glad um, I'm going through this with the youth group. And that's the cool thing about teaching is it's a mirror. That's what that's uh, God said in His Word. This is a mirror. you got to look at it first. Oh, man. Uh, i got to fix my hair. i got to fix my face. i got to fix my heart. Right? That's what the Bible was intended for. To keep on checking up on us. How are you doing? Where are you at? Where is your heart? That is... Really, a big part of reading the Bible is, where are you? How are you doing? Are you seeking first the kingdom of God? It's, it's a good question to ask ourselves. Or are you only focused on things of this earth? In verse 4 it says, When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. This is a small part of seeking heaven is what's to come. What's to come. When Christ appears, when he's revealed, guess what? We will be completely new. The presence of sin, gone. The presence of pain, gone. <laughs> That's an encouragement. That's a hope. Amen. Read it. Re the end of Revelation. It tells us there will be no more tears. There will be no more pain. There will be no more national wailing or screaming or weeping it's all going to disappear Amen. and he's going to make everything right he's going to make everything right he's going to heal our hearts completely oh I can't wait for that day he will appear in his own timing and we are going to be transformed completely let's read verse 5 together it says Therefore, put to death your members which are on earth. You see how in the beginning he's saying, look towards heaven. Now he says, therefore, put to death your members which are on earth. And these are what we're supposed to put to death. Fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. If you notice, well, maybe you did, that out of the six things he lists, five of them deal with sexual immorality. It's a huge issue to God. Um, the first word where it says fornication, the Greek word is pornea, and that would have to do with anything pornographic, it would have to do with anything sex or anything of that nature outside of marriage or while in marriage outside of your spouse and then the strong desires of passion evil desires uncleanliness um, and then covetousness is the greed I want more from me it's all about me I spend my money on me it's just about me and God says this is all idolatry it's having a higher position than God himself and he says what to do with it Kill it. That's when it says, put to death your members or your flesh. You've heard of that um, Bible term before. Your flesh and the spirit. Your flesh wants to do what's bad. The spirit is what drives to do what's good. And he says, break away from it. Put to death. This is um, part of seeking heaven is forsaking our sinful desires. Jesus provides this freedom. Like I said in chapter 2, people were saying, just try really hard, just try really hard, just try really hard. Have any of you tried really hard not to do something? And guess what? You end up doing it anyways. I mean, it can last for a little while, but eventually you're going to cave in and you're going to feel really shameful and dirty and disgusting and mad at yourself. I thought I had the strength. Or maybe you did have the strength for a little bit. But it's, it's like, a, it's like a, the weeds outside your house. If you, if you just hit him with the weed whacker, 
right? It, it reduces them. This is what we typically do. We reduce, we, we hide it, we, we don't typically show it in public, but we'll keep it in our heart, we'll keep it contained for a little bit. But guess what? The root is still down in there. The only way to get rid of a reed, weed completely is to take the root out, right? So evil desires are the same way. You have to go to the root, not just try to break the habit. It's a hard issue, okay? So God needs to come inside and set you free. And this is, this is a great news, that there's nothing, nothing that God can't break, that He can't take down, that He can't take out of your life. Nothing. We, we make excuses. That's what we do. That's what I do. Uh, my son David, he, he's, he's been doing this recently. Not so much that recently, but like, uh, for example, we asked him to carry this book. He's like, it's too hard. I'm like, David, that's like one, not even one pound. Like, you can do it. He's like, it's too hard. And he doesn't like really cry. He's just whines. I'm like, no, David, you can do it. Like, just take it to the door. Fine. Oh, we do that. Then. It's just too hard. No, you don't want to get rid of it. You don't want to take it out of your life. You like it, or else you get rid of it, right? That's just the truth. But God provides the freedom. The Spirit provides the freedom over sin, the power to kill sin and its desires. Sure, sin and um, being tempted isn't a sin, right? If we're tempted to do something. Uh, but it's giving into that desire. That's when it becomes a sin. That's when we go wrong against God. Is when we take the bait, right? Here's the bait. You want some? That's not a sin being tempted. But when you bite onto it, that's the sin. So I'm not saying that we'll never be tempted or we'll never have a bad thought or evil desire. But when it comes, kill it. <laughs> when it comes, kill it. Say no. That's a simple way to say it. Say no to your sin. No, I'm not doing that. I'm not going there. I'm not thinking that. That's as simple as it is. I tell the, the little kids that. When, when temptation comes, you say, God, help me to say no. That's as simple as it is. Yeah, there's a battle going on. But with God's help, that's as simple as it, as it is. Um. The language of putting to death indicates that Christians have to make a severe measure to conquer sin. Jesus said that it's better to go into heaven with one eye than be thrown into hell with two eyes. Or he said it's better to be thrown into or be taken into heaven maimed than to go into eternal fire, eternal death. He, was, he wasn't saying cut off your hand, he wasn't saying cut off your eye, because someone who struggles with lust, if they cut out their eyes, they're still going to have their mind. Right? Someone who struggles with stealing, if you cut off their hand, I heard a story where they cut off their hand, they cut off the other hand, because they kept on stealing, and they kept on stealing with their teeth. <laughs> it's because it's a heart issue. It's not a hand or eye. It's, it's the heart and the eye. And that's what God is aiming for. That's what He tells us to do, not just Oh, uh, it's not something to take lightly. So, if you find yourself in any of these categories, being sexually impure or greedy, deal with it today. Cut it out of your life. Say, God, help me. Spirit, fill my heart. Take this evil out of me. Change me. This is against you. He, he clearly says it. There's no getting around this. It's not... Of money. It's very specific. Don't be involved with this. And this is why he says, because the wrath of God is going to come upon people who practice these things. Don't engage in them, he says very clearly. And before you think that God, people call, this, call God this mockingly, they say, cosmic joy kill, because he just wants to give us a bunch of rules. Uh, no. He gives these serious warnings because he knows that the results of these actions are painful and deadly. The Bible says that sin gives way to death. That's what it says in James. It says in Romans as well. I've seen countless number of people who become very hurt by stepping outside of God's boundaries 
when it comes to um, being sexual. You probably know a ton of them. Maybe you were that person that really hurt yourself or other people. And God is only trying to spare us. And I also want to add this, that God isn't saying that sex is bad. It's his gift to the married couple. He wants you to keep it within those boundaries. Right? If you step outside of it, that's what makes sin sin. Is you're going outside of God's ways. But he wants to bless us. He doesn't want us hurt. Like I don't want my little Jonathan who wants to throw the ball in the street and run after it continually. I say no. And I give him a spanking. I say no, you're not going to go out in the street. Why not? Because you don't see the cars. God is only trying to protect us. Not to rob us of joy. Amen. Let's go ahead and... Oh, yeah. Verse 7, it says... This is a pretty crucial verse to this section. It says, In which you yourselves once walked when you live in them. So there's hope. Is that if you've done these things, or you did in the past, and, and you're forgiven, you're forgiven. God says that He cast our sin as far as the east is from the west. He doesn't remember them anymore. As a father pities his child, so the Lord pities those who fear Him. That's what Psalm um, 103 says. That's encouraging, because guess what? I was doing these things, but now I have freedom. Now I have a new life. Now, those who are in the past... And I'm going forward. I left them behind. They were buried in the grave. So, there's still hope today. Are you breathing? All of you breathing here? If you find yourself in, in one of these areas, eliminate it. That's what Jesus says. That's what God is saying. Eliminate it. You will be forgiven. There is hope. This should be a past tense description of you, not a present tense description of you. Verse 8 says, But now you yourselves are to put off all these. So here's another list that he tells us to cut out, eliminate. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. And then finally, do not lie to one another, since you have been put off, since you have put off the old man with his deeds. Number one, anger. It's this simmering, um, constant thinking about um, Hatred or a wrongdoing towards other or God, you're really angry at God and it's just simmering, it just sits there all day long. Or bitterness. And then wrath is anger like a volcano. Like someone's yelling, screaming, kicking, punching, rolling in the mud. They're doing all that. He says, it's not fitting. Take it off. That's part of the old man. That's part of the flesh. Malice, it's having wrong intentions towards others, your enemies, people who don't like, they don't like you. Blasphemy is disrespect or mocking God, things of God, what he stands for. And uh, filthy language, in uh, Ephesians it says, it's not fitting that, that you shall speak uh, disrespectfully to people, but saying bad words we say, things that are not appropriate to come out of a Christian's mouth. Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, we have to catch ourselves, we have to recognize, okay, things are not coming out that are good, there's something wrong in here. I need to go and pray and repent. That's what you need to do if you are struggling with your mouth. Once again, ask for God's help. It's, it's that simple. Be open to His help. So with this list, is there any sin that you need to deal with today? Anything you're struggling with that you need help? If you say, oh man, like, I'm really scared. Like, ding, 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 I'm hitting all these. <laughs> well, you're either in two categories. You're a non-believer, or you're a believer. Okay? Non-believer, ask for God to save you. Ask for Him to come into your heart, to be your Lord, to be your Savior, 
to pay for your sin that you cannot pay for. Ask for him to forgive you. And repent means to stop doing that. And to do what's right. That's what Ephesians tells us. Stop doing what's wrong, start doing what's right. For the believer, if you're doing these, you should have that, oh man, God is, yeah, you're speaking to me. You're telling me I should stop doing this. Repent. And turn to God. He'll forgive you. Stop doing that. Uh, can you be perfect? Not this side of heaven. Absolutely not. Oh. <laughs> I can't wait for that day. I can't wait for the day. I don't know about you guys. But he does tell us to put off. Verse 10 says, And have put on the new man, who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So, put off, put off, put off, put off, put off, he tells us. But now, he calls us to the positive. Put on. It's time to put on. It's not, it's great to stop doing bad things. But it's time to start doing good things. In Titus it says, be zealous for good works. Be passionate. Have that in the forefront of your mind. I'm going to do what's right. For God and because of God. You have been made a new person. So you've been tra transformed. <laughs> yeah, we still have our, our struggles, our sins, but you are a new creation. The old things have passed away. That's what the Bible says. However, we still need to be worked on. So I don't think I'm the only one that's noticed all this construction going around Everywhere. <laughs> right? Everywhere. I thought I could go this way without construction. Nope. We are under construction. Our whole lives have been here. But guess what? We're progressing. We're not going backwards. We're being built up. We're being strengthened. We're being encouraged. We're leaving things behind. We're being made better. If you're not being made better, I don't know what to tell you other than you need Jesus. <laughs> he tells us that this new man is renewed. It's a process. It's being renewed in the knowledge according to the image of Him. How do we become different? How do we become transformed? Romans chapter 12 says, by the renewing of your mind. You need a new mind. <laughs> you need God's help. Because you want to think, you want to plan these things, you want to think about these things that, guess what, are offensive to God. But, He can transform you. That's the power of God. That's one of the greatest miracles of a transformed human. The heart and the mind. Being, uh, allowing God access into there and shaping your mind. And when you are renewed, then it's going to be, uh, then that is proper worship. Go ahead and read 12, uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2, and you will see how um, it's a beautiful thing to God. It's a sweet smell, smell and aroma to God. So our end goal for being changed or being renewed is to be more like Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the end goal of being renewed. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, it says this, uh, well, it says, for the uh, fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are all characteristics of God. And those are all characteristics or evidence of God working in our lives, in our heart. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it like we know it as the love chapter, the, the wedding chapter. You, you hear it quoted a lot of times at weddings. But it's really a description of Jesus. If you go ahead and, and go back and you put Jesus every time it says love, you'll see that it fits. That's what we're aiming for. That's our goal. Will we ever become uh, Jesus or no? Will we ever become a God? No. But we will be like Jesus in the end. And I'm thankful because I'm glad I'm not going to stay the way I am. Neither are you. That's, a, <laughs> that's an encouraging thing. It really is. It just really is. So, 
In verse 11 it says, Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. God tells us in many places that he has no favorites. A pastor doesn't have a higher uh, position in God's eyes than a little kid or you. You're not higher than me. I'm not higher than you. God doesn't care about our education. Well, not that he doesn't care, but he doesn't look at our education status, our employment status, our race, how much money we have. We are all equal, sons and daughters. If you believe in Jesus, you're equal. We all have the same access to God. The pastor and the guy who comes for the first time and believes in Jesus. He has the same access. And that's pretty awesome. There's no levels of Christianity. Yeah, you can draw closer to God than other people. You can be walking more faith in, than other people. But you're not higher in position. No, we're all equal. And he's saying this because don't think because you're smart or you're educated or you have a nice job that God favors you more. No. Nope. He loves the other guy just as much. The slave, that's what he's saying here. The masters and the slaves, God doesn't see a difference. He loves them both. Let's read verse 12 together. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, and meekness. In verse 12, Paul gives us a small list, small but mighty list, of our position of Christ. Number one, we were chosen. Number two, we are set apart. That's the holy means for God. Number three, we are loved. All this was done before we were even born. That's encouraging. God loved us with an everlasting love for those of us who believe in Him. And I am thankful for that. Because, hey, guess what? When we fail, God still loves us. <laughs> That's encouraging. Ah. Because of this, because you are chosen, because you are holy, because you are loved, now I want you to live this way, is basically what he's saying. Put on tender mercy, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. All of these were counterintuitive to the culture of their time. Someone who's meek was seen as weak. Someone who's humble, seen as weak. Someone who's kind, no. You try to cheat people, you try to get the best for yourself. But what he's saying here is, do the best for others. And do we have that mindset? I'm going to do the best for others. Or do we have the mindset, what about me, 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 me? And, and putting on Christ, putting on the Spirit, is saying, let's look at others. Right? In Philippians, I believe it's chapter 2, he says, put on the mind of Christ. And then it talks about how he put everyone above him. How he went to the point of death. And that's our example. Once again, that's, that's, what, we're, that's what we're being transformed to become more like. It's Jesus, the way he acted. So put on these things, these qualities. In uh, verse 13 it says, Bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. That is really a supreme quality of being transformed is forgiving others. Letting go of the pain, the hurt that someone else has done to you. The deep pain, the deep scars you have, saying, I'm going to let you deal with this guy. I'm going to let this go. I'm not going to hold on to this. That's really trusting God. It's forgiving one another. And you're acting like Jesus. Right? Imagine if God says, no, you don't deserve it. <laughs> Where would we be? Hell. No, you weren't a good boy today. You weren't. A, no, you're mean today. You're rude today. You don't get forgiveness. <sighs> right? But we treat other people that way. You did this to me. You said this to me. How dare you? You hurt me. And uh, a list of other things that you might say. Do we have someone to forgive? In Luke chapter 7, verse 36 
to the end, I would highly encourage you to read that. He says, if you forgive little, it shows that you um, have been forgiven little. You really don't understand what God has done for you. But if you forgive a lot, you do understand what God has done for you. I would encourage you to read that. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. It talks about the two servants, the wicked servant who wouldn't forgive um, his servant for the debt he paid or had, but he was forgiven. And God says, you wicked servant. You wicked servant. I haven't forgiven you a debt you couldn't pay, but someone else who has sinned against you, you can't forgive them? It's like, oh, that is pretty strong language from Jesus. Are you serious about it? Forgive. Even when he says, you pray, if you have something against a brother or sister, deal with it before you go and pray. Because it so traps us. It so shrinks our heart when we don't forgive. Forgive. As Christ has forgiven you. You know you've been forgiven. That will help you in the direction of forgiving and then he says in verse 14, But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. So, yes, to be tender, be kind, be humble, be meek, bear with one another, forgive one another, but most importantly, put on unselfish love, agape. Put others first. That's what he says. And this will hold everything together. Verse 15 says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. This is available to us as individuals. We have peace with God. That means there's nothing um, in the way, there's no obstacle anymore, our sin. God has dealt with that. We can have access to God, and He has access to our hearts. He comes and live, live inside of us, and He bring, provides that peace. And it's not a peace where everything has to be the way that I want it, and then I'll have peace. It's the peace where everything is not how I want it right now, and I'm freaking out, but God's going to settle me down. God's going to bring a relax to my heart. This is the peace that it's talking about. The peace that surpasses understanding. Where God invades in your life. His presence. And you know, it's okay. In light of what's going on. So there's peace available to us in our heart. But there's also peace as brethren, as brothers and sisters. That there shouldn't be this arguing or bickering or this um, hatred towards one another. It should be peaceful in the church. And at large, too. But we have a problem. We really do. Um, and we need, we need God's help. <laughs> we need Him to provide that peace. And then He says, be thankful. <laughs> I uh, like doing this every once in a while. I should probably do it every day. But um, Well, you list five things, ten things that you're thankful for. And it could be as simple as, wow, I had a cup of coffee, or God, I had food on the plate today. I had enough money to buy clothes. You are thankful for your own things and your relationship with God. But he calls us here to be thankful. I think four times in this um, letter he says to be thankful. Paul is in <laughs> prison at this point. And he's writing these marvelous and beautiful, and some of it was not really um, clearly stated until God revealed it to Paul. And he's in a terrible situation, circumstance. But he's rising above it, and he tells his readers, he says, be thankful. That's like someone who's paralyzed, saying, be thankful for what, for what God has done, and for who God is. That's the kind of comparison that I got. Are we so filled with complaints and... Oh, this is bad. That's bad. This is bad. That's bad. You know what? That's not helpful to anyone. <laughs> and God told us not to complain. He told us to be thankful over and over and over and over and over and over. Not pretending, but real, genuine. Thanksgiving. 
God doesn't want our thanks, God. Or like when you tell your kid, say thank you, thank you. No, he wants to come from the heart. He wants the real thing. And uh, it's just an encouragement to me, man. What you're going through, I'm pretty sure you can be thankful, Frankie. <laughs> what you're going through, I'm pretty sure you can be thankful. In, in light of all that you're going through, God is with you. I really highly suggest that. Find some things you can be thankful for. There are plenty. There really are plenty. But don't focus on what we can change. So, he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks. There you go. He says again, To God the Father, through Him. So, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's a great question to ask yourself. Are you allowing God's word, the word dwell means to make it home. You know when you go to someone's house for the first time, you're very polite and kind. And at least you want to be, you should be, right? Okay, they take off their shoes. Okay, I take off my shoes. They eat this way, I'm going to eat that way. And then, uh, when you get to know them better, you're just laying on their couch and they're eating popcorn together, they're talking at the same time. That's being comfortable, right? Is Christ comfortable in your heart? Is Christ comfortable to stay there and push everything out? Is he making are you making room for him in your heart? Think of, think of it as a house. That's what he's saying here. And let the word what Jesus stands for and all that he um, has brought and said, let it sit in there and change you, basically. That's what he's saying. And with this word and with scripture, teach and admonish one another. Teaching to do, uh, teaching spiritual things, spiritual matters, giving understanding to it. And then admonishing would be counseling or saying, you should be doing this or you should be doing that. Don't go that way, go this way. Because this is what the Bible says. Not because it's my own opinion, not because I'm making this up or this seems good. This is what God's Word says. And in love. You're supposed to speak always with love and grace. Now, I told you to do this. Well, why did you do that? Are you so... Do you have a brain? No. Sometimes we might feel that way, but we need to put on the Spirit. <laughs> put, on, put on love. And, and do this to one another. When we gather together, we should be talking to each other. Okay, how's your life? What's going on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. And you don't have to be like this robotic, but what does the Bible have to say about it? Or have you asked God for wisdom? Have you looked into the Word for wisdom? For help? For guidance? For direction? But we want to be giving God's truth God's ways rather than our own opinions. Or the world's opinion. Yeah, we used to do this back in the day, or my friends did it this way. Well, are they following God's way, or they're making up as they go? And that's, that's what we want to stay away from. Once again, is the word of Christ dwelling in you richly? I hope it is. And this, this just naturally brings up, are you reading your Bible every day? Maybe you say, I don't know what to read. Start going through Matthew, or Luke, or John. Just keep going right. And then to keep on doing it over and over and over and over and over. And start in the Old Testament. You can do both. You can read the New Testament in the morning, Old Testament at night, or New Testament first three days of the week, Old Testament four days of the week. There's no exact formula. But are you reading, are you meditating, and are you allowing God to speak to you? To show you something. For it to be a mirror. Right? He also says to um, it, speak to it one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual psalms. Um, with the psalms, I would say all of scripture. Right? It's not just the psalms. But the psalms are beautiful. I love them. Absolutely do. Um, the hymns 
hymns are just um, held on to songs for a very long time by the church, and then spiritual songs are spiritual songs. And what's important about all of these is that we sing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That's what's key there. It's not just, blessed be the name of God. And you're thinking about a hamburger, or you're thinking about a sports game, or you're thinking about a video you watch. That is not what he's saying here. Is your mind, is your heart focused on God? I was talking about this with the youth kids that God, once again, isn't desiring from us to pretend or fake it. There's beautiful psalms, like Psalm, 40, Psalm 42, it says, As the deer pants for water, so my soul longs for God. He's saying, basically, I'm dead inside. I don't have any strength. I'm sad. He said, I've been crying all night. He said, my tears mock me. They say, where is your God? But in that psalm, I believe it's three times, it says, hope in God. Hope in your salvation. Hope in God. Hope in your salvation. <laughs> there was another psalm. I think it was uh, 44, if I can remember right. And he's basically saying, the nations tell us, all people surround us like, yeah, I don't see your God. I don't hear your God. Where's your God? Right? Don't our circumstances tell us that sometimes? Where's your God? Don't people tell us that? Oh yeah, you're a Christian, but how's your life going? He's there. The, the Psalms, that's what I think is so beautiful about them. They're so, you see the dark and you see the light. You see being, uh, they, they feel like God is nothing, but God is there. And then there's just beautiful songs of praise, just pure praise just flowing. What I love about worship, worship songs, we call them, praise songs, I like to call them, is they teach us something about God, or they remind us something about God. And they remind us of what He's done for us. So, when we come in and, man, things are not good, things were not pretty today, or yesterday, or this week, or last month, or last year, you know what? I'm going to have faith, and I'm going to sing this song about God. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. We're going to sing something like that. Or, you know, He can move the mountains, or uh, Waymaker, right? We sing songs like that. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so, um, it's not like, Waymaker, like, yeah, that's, that's good for everyone else, but for me, mm, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. No! It's, he is a way maker. He is with us. He is good. It's not. We shouldn't worship or praise out of tradition or because it's our routine, but because it's genuine and sincere and we're thankful. That's what real praise is. You know, Paul, Paul and Silas, I believe was, were praising in prison while being chained. I'm like, I just can't get there next to I'm like, how is that even possible? Like stinky, dark, like they were doing good and they got punished bad for it multiple times. Or and Paul saying over and over, if you read the New Testament letters, it says, be thankful, rejoice in the Lord. And in Philippians, he's also writing that from jail. And he says, rejoice, it's like 10 or 12 times, I can't remember. He's like, rejoice, 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 rejoice. Not because He's pretending everything is good. <laughs> Absolutely not. But because God is good. That's why we rejoice. That's why we sing in faith. Verses 18 through 25. Let's read this together. It says, Wives, submit to your own husbands, as is fitting to the Lord. Verse 19. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be bitter or harsh towards them. Verse 20, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Father, fathers, or parents, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bondservants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, and not to men 
knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done. And there is no partiality. Verse 1 of chapter 4. Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. So we start off this chapter by saying, seek those things which are above. Um, remember that you are um, seated with Christ in heavenly places. Set your mind on things above. You, you died, you are buried, but you are raised to life again. And then he gives a list of all these, stop doing this, stop doing that, stop doing this, stop doing that, start doing this, start doing this, start doing this. And now it seems like he transitioned a little to, okay, how should you conduct your life with other people? But this is part of seeking heaven. It's seeking heaven on earth. Number one, it says, wives, submit to your own husbands. And then it, I'm going to highlight this. I'm going to go through it right now. It says, as is fitting to the Lord. So you have God in mind with your relationship with your husband. Okay? That's number one. You submit to your husband. Number two, husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. Remember, he just had said, forgive them if they've done you wrong. Right? He says, forgive one another if they have anything against you. And then he says, do not be bitter. Do not deal with them rudely in a, in a harsh way, in a mean way, mean words, physically mean. Verse 20, children, obey your parents. And then it says, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Children, you want to be well-pleasing to the Lord if we have any here? Obey your parents. That's what children are called to do. How are they pleasing God? How do they live under God's will? Obey your parents. <laughs> That's not very hard. God made it that simple because your children obey your parents' children. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Parents, do not be too harsh on them. <laughs> a good, good uh, way to go about it is, do you judge yourself as hardly as you judge your kids? A good question. Are you so hard on your kids you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do wrong, you can't do wrong, you can't do wrong, but wait a minute, you give yourself some space, you give yourself, okay, I'll give myself a little grace, you know, today was a hard day. Yeah, that's not a good uh, formula to use. Be kind to your children. Be loving. Be given discipline, of course. Give structure. And uh, they'll really thrive. That's what the Bible says, that's what Proverbs says. And you guys say, oh yeah, this guy's young, you know, and he doesn't know what he's talking about. That's what the Bible says, okay? <laughs> I'm trying it out, okay? I'm, I'm working, working on it. Verse 22, bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. And then he says, with sincerity of heart. So he's saying, don't be lazy at work. This is talking about slaves here, but we can apply it to today's world. Don't be lazy at work. It's that simple. <laughs> Want to know why? Want to know the cure to laziness is? Fear of God. Having Him, He's watching me. He knows what I'm doing. He's taking account. And I have him, him, him in mind. And then it says, and whatever you do, do it heartily. You could be flipping a burger. You can be wilding. You could be reading a book. You could be teaching. You could be a police officer. You could be whatever. Do it heartily to God's glory. As to the Lord, for God. Then, uh, verse 24, Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. If you've noticed, he said, Serve the Lord Christ. As to the Lord, fear God. This is well pleasing to the Lord. It is fitting to the Lord. All of this is pointing to one thing. Seeking first the kingdom of God. Putting God's first, His glory first, and there's not more to it. It's that. We can live for God's glory by sweeping, by taking care of our kids, by washing the dishes, mowing the lawn, fill in the blank. That's good, of course. We can do it all unto the Lord. That's what it says. Do everything. Singing a song, whistling, skipping, blowing bubbles. Do it all with God on your mind. And it shouldn't be like, oh, like, 
this weight on us, like, oh, I have to do everything ever. To the glory of God, and it's like, God is with me, I'm doing this, I'm at peace, I'm not stressed out about this, I'm going to do this in honor of Him, for Him, for His glory. Man, why are you such a good worker? Because I'm doing it for Jesus. Look at all these other people, they're lazy. And this is sad too, I've heard this a lot over the years, is people are, Christians are known for being lazy, I don't know why. It's like, maybe they don't read their Bible or something, because it says that all over the Bible it's like, Work hard, work hard, don't be lazy, work hard. <laughs> and the Proverbs says it a bunch, New Testament says it a bunch. But it's like, there's, in some areas, some places, it's like, oh no, we don't want another Christian. They're lazy, or they just sit on their phone, or they just, they don't have out. We don't want to give that reputation to being a Christian. So, what does it look like to seek heaven? Talked about this in the beginning and all throughout. Reading your Bible is definitely a way of seeking heaven. Praying, fasting, praising, giving money, serving, preaching the gospel or sharing the gospel, making disciples, but also putting to death our flesh and living in freedom, being changed daily by the renewing of our minds, putting on the new man and putting on love, being faithful and submissive wives, being faithful and loving husbands, being obedient children, being godly parents, being a hard worker for Christ, being a just and fair employer. Once again, ultimately, all that we do, all things, in all things, in word or deed, do them in the name of Jesus. If you can't do it in the name of Jesus, don't do it. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty obvious. Don't do it if you can't do it in the name of Jesus. These are a list of do's and don'ts to get into a good relationship with God. These are do's and don'ts because we love God and because we're abiding in Him. Put things off because we need to. Put things on because we need to. So the question is, is what do you need to put off? It's for you individually, for me individually. What do you need to put off? That needs to go bye-bye. That needs to be killed. And what do I need to put on? You might say, oh, I'm doing pretty good on the put-offs. But how are you doing on the put-ons? <laughs> and that's, that's where it's, it, the ball is given to you now. We're going to do singing. This is a great time to say, God, this has been going on. You obviously know from God. And uh, I need help. I need your spirit. I need to be renewed in my mind. I need to change, God. I need to stop doing this. I don't have the power, and I need you. The worship team can not come up. They're here somewhere. If someone wants to give their life to Jesus for the first time, I can pray with you down here if you'd like. And um, I'm going to pray for all of us right now. So. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your love. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for keeping us, for preserving us. Thank you for being with us in the storms of life, and the tragedies of life, the pains and hurts. Thank you for not leaving us when we mess up, when we fail, when we go to the side, when we step outside the lines, uh, your commandments, your ways, your will. Lord, but draw us close to you. You promised us if we draw close to you, draw close to us. And we pray, Lord, that we would not try to defeat our flesh, our sin, by trying really hard, having our own strength, but calling upon you. You are the almighty God. Nothing is too hard for you. Lord, And uh, I pray, Lord, for any relationship um, that is struggling right now, Lord, that you would um, bring life, that um, someone in here would well, all of us would know that we are risen with Christ. But there's hope. It is not hopeless that you're in our lives. You're in our hearts. And Lord, we want to just give you the room to change us, change our, our, our lives. Change the way we deal with our kids. Change the way that we deal with our coworkers. Change the way that we deal with our enemies. Lord, you, um, you want to change us. And uh, I thank you that you're a faithful father. Thank you that 
we do have a glory awaiting us. That this is just uh, a pilgrimage and that we will spend eternity with you. That you'll make all things new, a new heaven, new earth, new bodies, new minds. Oh, we can't wait for the day. And would you fill us? Would you strengthen us? Would, would you, Lord, um, get glory from our lives? Would we seek your kingdom first above all else? Thank you, Jesus, um, for your word. Thank you for who you are towards us. In your name, brother. Amen.